welcome back to another exciting and insightful episode of Me and My Health Stuff. I'm your host, Anthony Harcher, a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist, aka the healthy man, according to his kids. And today's episode is about how our food choices affect our moods. So as you've probably realized, foods and moods go hand in hand, and we often choose food to affect our mood, don't we? So uh, we it's sometimes it's referred to as emotional eating, okay? So that's today's episode. And before we get into today's episode, I'd love to give a shout out to my listeners in Tasmania. Yes, I have a growing fan base in Tasmania. I really appreciate the t- Tasmanians joining in and, uh, you know, basically enlightening and enhancing their well-being uh, through this program. So thank you. Shout out to those in Tassie. And it, no doubt it's cold down there. It's getting cold here in Sydney, Australia. And also to those in America. So we have a fan base in America uh, that's also very invested in their health and well-being. And I want to shout out to those in America. And it's an exciting time in America going into summer. So things are warming up in America cooling down in Australia and probably a bit ultra cool in Tassie. So let's get into today's episode because we can all relate no matter where in the world we're from, whether we're in America, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, the Pacific, uh, Europe. So no matter where we are, we realize that foods affect our moods and we use food to affect our mood. So that's today's episode. That's what I'm going to share with you in terms of that insight. So does what you really eat matter? Is that a <laughs> silly question? <laughs> you probably, you wouldn't be tuned into this episode if, uh, or certainly in, into the Me and My Health Up podcast, if you didn't think that what you ate really mattered. And I wouldn't have studied nutrition if I didn't think what I ate mattered. So yes, it's a funny question, but I asked that question because it really depends. And you're probably thinking, why are you thinking that, Anthony? That's a bit silly to think that way. Well, it depends based on your values. And so we behave according to our values, what is most important to us. And some people don't have a high priority on their health. They have a higher priority on their career, on their area of value, which could be their family. Uh, And health may not be a significant factor to that family. It may be more around the connection, the relationships. So yes, we know health impacts all areas of our lives, but people focus on what they value most. As you probably realize, one of my highest values is health and your health health and well-being. So that's why I do the Me and My Health Up podcast. That's what drives me. That's what intrinsically motivates me is because I have a high value on health and well-being. But realizing that there's people out there, friends that are out there, you know, that may have a low priority on health. And so we shouldn't judge them uh, for that. Uh, It is what it is. And until they realize how health affects their area that they consider really valuable, such as their career, uh, such as their family, then if they don't see that linkage, then it's they're always going to struggle to see how health is going to serve them because they probably haven't asked the question. So certainly it would help uh, to for them to ask the question, to value health more and to help them uh, live longer, to inspire their family and also to have a successful career. Uh, it's really hard to uh, have continuing career success with poor health. So that's enough in terms of values for now anyway, <laughs> because values also also affect our mood. Uh, but we'll get into that a bit later. I just wanted to uh, talk about health. And obviously, you're tuned into health, it's a high value to you. So that question has been answered. Now, what are the other factors that influence our food choices? So we have biological determinants such as hunger, our appetite and taste. Yes, we taste is one of our sensory inputs. And so we we can seek a particular taste, we can feel like a particular taste. And biological signals can tell us that we desire a particular taste and that that can be driven in terms of how we're feeling. So how we're feeling may dictate what we actually eat. And you could probably relate to this in terms of when you're feeling a bit down, what type of foods you go to when you're feeling a bit down. So just think about that. When you're feeling a bit low, what foods do you gravitate towards? Do you gravitate towards chocolate? Do you gravitate towards sweets? Do you gravitate towards high carbohydrates, high fat foods? Yes, everything I just mentioned there all elevate our mood. 
And so you can see how when your mood is down, you could gravitate to those foods based on our biological uh, association with taste and what it brings in terms of how it changes our neurochemistry in our mind. The other determining factor is our economics. So the economic determinants, such as the cost and what income we earn, the cost of food, what income we earn, as we know, foods get more and more expensive, and the availability. Now, in terms of cost, the foods that we can sometimes crave to improve our moods can be really have a cost advantage, essentially. They're highly processed, so high fat, high carbohydrate, foods are heavily processed. They're processed with re relatively cheap raw ingredients, raw materials. So sugars readily available. Uh, it's one of the ingredients for highly refined carbohydrates. And then if you're thinking about fats, then the fats that are generally not at considered the good fats, the more they're easier to process, they're easier to access, there's more of it available in terms of farmers that are producing that vegetable oil. That's, you know, having that cost base that's really good for us uh, in you know when we have economics that we have a rising cost of living we're concerned about what we're spending our money on then these cheaper foods that can also enhance our mood become more attractive so that affects what we eat um, and what we eat affects our mood and how we're feeling affects what we eat <laughs> and how much money we have affects what we buy so they all go hand in hand. There's so many factors here that dictate as to what we end up choosing. And then the other one is the physical determinants, such as the access, the education that we have, uh, the skills that we have. So for me, I'm highly skilled in nutrition. I have education around health. And so for me, I can have, well, I've got more neural pathways as to, yes, I may be feeling like this food, but is this food going to serve me long term? Like, is it going to get me through the day or is it going to... Send, send me high and then I'm going to crash and need to eat something else to pick me up again. And so I have the education, whereas some other people may not have the education around what certain foods do to them, such as those highly refined carbohydrates I mentioned. Sugar. Okay, so sugar is going to spike the blood. It's going to release some dopamine, which is our reward, recognition area. We feel good and we're thinking, yeah, I feel great. I've had, so, I had a, sh a shot of sugar, had a, you know, I'm on a sugar high, but then we crash. Okay, because what our body does is overproduce insulin in order to put that glucose away, uh, to tuck it away into cells and if there's excess into fat. And so our body wants to regulate the, our bloodstream and keep it in homeostasis. And so it does that by producing insulin, which insulin opens up the cell to receiving glucose. Glucose feeds our cells. Now, when we're con continually consuming high amounts of sugar, that results in lots of insulin being produced. And then our body becomes quite desensitized to insulin. And then it doesn't want to take up as much because it's thinking, well, you're always knocking on my door to let more glucose in. You know, is this the boy who cried wolf? <laughs> um, and so we, we can become quite desensitized towards insulin and getting the sugar out of our bloodstream. And then that can create problems. Or what, what it does is when we've got high amounts of insulin, it, it can also then drive it to fat cells, which then creates extra, you know, extra fat cells. <laughs> so, uh, and it enlarges, you know, enlarges fat cells, you know, makes them bigger and we put on weight, uh, which none of us like. Um, so that's what happens with food, mood, um, the cost of it being so cheap and accessible. So a lot of these these highly refined products are advertised. They're always around us. We walk down the streets. We can often smell these foods. We can smell the ice cream shop. We can smell our fats, the um, the volatile oils in the air. If we pick it up through our nose receptors and we get lit up by smelling fats. So when a barbecue, well, what can you smell with a barbecue? <laughs> you, can't, you don't smell the protein. Uh, you don't cook sugar on the barbecue, or well, most people don't. It's, it, it's the fats that you smell, and it's the fats you're thinking, oh, that smells good, okay? Because we're wired that way. Fats are highly calorific, and we know calories is what we need to survive. We need energy. We need energy to survive. We need energy to function. We just don't need copious amounts and excess amounts of energy. <laughs> so, But we're wired that way to be attracted to those fatty smells. Uh, so those frying, that frying 
smells so good. You know, it smells good to anyone, really, um, even if you're educated like myself. So yes, the that physical determinants, such as the cost of food, really can really implicate what someone eats. And then we have the social determinants. So what is what, what are our friends eating? What are our friends chosen? And you think, well, I, I want to be like them. I want to fit in. Uh, we, we crave to be connected. We have a human craving to connect with others. And so when others are eating hamburgers, we think, well, why not? They're eating it. Well, why shouldn't I? <laughs> um, I want to fit in. I want to feel connected. And so we, we have these social determinants, social factors that influence what we eat. So all these factors, such as the biological, the economic, the physical, and the social have an impact on what we choose to eat. And that also impacts our mood. Okay, so some, some foods, as I mentioned before, have a positive correlation to mood and other foods probably have a more neutral correlation to mood. So we don't really crave vegetables, do we? <laughs> I don't know many people that actually crave vegetables. They may crave fried vegetables, tempura and stuff like that, but it's, it's more the fat association with those vegetables. So this is the difficult situation we find ourselves in today is that sometimes we crave the fruit based on the sugar, okay? So it's more that sugar connection our body has in association with fruit. It's sweet and it can uplift us. Not as much as a lolly will, because <laughs> lollies are highly processed. Fruit comes with fiber. And yes, it's it's like when we ingest the fruit, the whole fruit, so not the apple juice. So the apple juice is essentially a bit like a lolly. It's highly concentrated forms of sugar and that can easily spike the blood, spike our dopamine release in our mind um, and make us feel, you know, high in a sense. So these, whereas where we have the fruit, right, the fruit is slowly released because we're breaking down the fibers, extracting what we can in terms of the carbohydrates we can ingest and the carbohydrates we can't that end up in our feces. So our body's busy doing that extraction process and it slowly releases the sugars into the blood. So we don't get such a sugar high when we have fruit, whole fruit. That's whole fruits, not refined fruit such as fruit juice. So you can probably see these. It's quite, it's not as simple as it seems. Like, as I mentioned before, there's that factor of education. Some people aren't empowered. And so we, sh we shouldn't judge others for what they're eating. They simply might not have the education and understanding of what food does to their longevity, what it does to their uh, energy in terms of sustainable energy. A lot of us, you know, not a lot of us, but certainly the listeners on the Me and My Health Up podcast realize that the slow release carbohydrates are the ones that give us the endurance, the stamina, and don't give us the peaks and troughs like highly refined carbohydrates such as sugar. So the slow slow release carbohydrates are come from whole foods, whole grains, okay? Whole grains, are seeds, nuts, they come from fruit, they, even vegetables, okay? So there's carbohydrates and vegetables, but they're slow release, they've, they've got fiber, they're bound to fiber, okay? So this is why it's a bit complicated, not so straightforward. Now, in terms of food and mood, right? So I mentioned you probably know the foods that elevate your mood, such as chocolate. So chocolate releases endorphins. Endorphins make us feel alive. They make us feel good. It's an, an endorphin to release when we are exercising, for example. This is why some people get addicted to exercise because of that positive release of endorphins that make us feel a bit elated, a bit euphoric. Um, they give us a bit of more resistance to pain or tolerance to pain. So these endorphins are something we can get quite attracted to. Chocolate can elevate endorphins. Exercise can elevate endorphins. Okay, sugar, more associated with dopamine. So dopamine, as I said before, that reward, recognition, and it makes us feel valuable, makes us feel uh, positive. It's a positive, it's a positive neurotransmitter. Uh, we seek more of it, we desire more of it. Hence why when we eat sugar, we can seek more of it because of the positive association it creates in our mind. Now, this is where it's challenging for children, right? They, This is their drug of choice that they're allowed to have. It's socially acceptable is highly refined carbohydrates or in other words, sugar, okay? And so parents will let them have sugar and it does, it, it makes them feel good. They associate sugar with feeling good and they want more of it. And the thing is, the more we have, we build up a tolerance. Our body gets better at breaking it down. 
okay? And so we need more of it in order to get the same effect. It's like drugs. It's like medicinal drugs. So what happens when we start taking medicinal drugs is in order to get the same effect on our body, what we need to do is take more of that drug over time. And that's what happens with sugar. <laughs> the more sugar we ingest over time, we need this more compared to what we initially had in order to get the same effect, in order to get the same hit. It's a bit like drugs, uh, recreational drugs, cocaine, heroin, for example. Uh, our body builds up a tolerance and then we need more of the drug in order to get the same effect. So sugar's the same and it's something that's socially acceptable for children, but it's why children get more and more a desire to eat more and more sugar, okay? And so it feeds itself. So it's one of these things where parents need to be mindful that, yes, a little bit's okay, but constant flow of sugar will create this sugar addiction. And over time, it will create an addiction that's hard to break. So the, the kids may notice that uh, over time, if they're becoming more sedentary, they may start gaining weight because they're consuming high amounts of calori calories, uh, they're consuming high amounts of refined carbohydrates, they're going on peaks and troughs, and when they hit the trough, they want more of the refined carbohydrates to pick them up again. And so it's this vicious cycle. They're consuming more and more calories, uh, doing less exercise, less moving around, more study, and weight can start coming on, and then they start feeling bad about their body, and how they look and their image, their self-image comes into play. And then so they go for more sugar. And so this creates this vicious cycle for children and also for adults. Adults also go through this cycle of it could be a chocolate, a bit of a chocolate addiction. Okay, so chocolate picks you up, you feel good. Then you have a phone call that comes in and the phone call is not so good. And maybe you perceive it as bad news. And then you're thinking, well, I have a, this positive association. When I eat chocolate, it makes me feel more positive. It lifts me up. So you go to the cupboard and get more chocolate, okay? So this is the, this thing where it just feeds itself and it gets a bit out of control. And hence why I've got the Me and My Health Up podcast to provide some insightful education so that you are empowered. You have a neural network pathways that you can then see foods and think, okay, yes, it's going to give me a, you know, a quick pick me up. However, then it's going to drop me off. I'm going to need more of it in order to keep going. So then you can think, well, what else can help pick me up a little bit rather than something that's more temporary? Uh, something that's going to be more sustainable and more sustainable in terms of long-term healthy outcomes. And that could be, okay, I'm feeling a bit flat. Uh, I know exercise elevates my endorphins, makes me feel a bit better. Uh, instead of going to the cupboard, I'm just going to go for a walk around the block. I know that sunshine, for example, increases serotonin, okay? And serotonin is that mood stabilizer, mood, and it can lift our mood as well. So get, getting outside, boosting your endorphins, you're getting some exposure to maybe some increased serotonin, that can make you feel better. And you come back and you feel better, but yet you're not going to have the drop off because of the sugar, okay? So the, the sugar, yes, will make you feel better temporarily, then you drop off, then you need something to pick you up again. And so it's not really sustainable and it's not going to help you long term. It, as I said, it could potentially turn into a sugar addic addiction, a chocolate addiction. And so in order to you know, overcome this, education is important. Hence why I do the podcast, why I'm sharing this with you today. Uh, the other thing is looking for alternatives to altering your mood. And I've mentioned in previous episodes about we can alter our mood through changing our perceptions. So if we perceive something as negative, look for the positive, okay? So you get some news that your interest rates are going up, okay? And then straight away, the media are portraying high interest rates as negative, right? And so you get this negative perception of high interest rates. But interest rates are part of life, right? They go up and down throughout our lifetime, and that's what interest rates do. It's what the, um, how they actually help curb inflation. So it's, there's a madness behind them. There's a method behind the madness, <laughs> perceived madness. So what we want to look for is what are the benefits of higher interest rates? Okay. Well, if you've got savings, higher interest rates are going to benefit your savings. You're going to get more interest income. Okay. If you don't have savings, well, how does higher interest rates benefit you? Well, they can benefit you in terms of you're going to have a now focus on your uh, budget, for example. So you're going to now think about what you spend your money on, which is wise in terms of long-term money management. So if you money manage money better, you will have more to ma manage over time. Okay, it's that compounding effect. So if you're saving more over time, saving and investing wisely over time, that compounds 
and creates more wealth. That's how we generate wealth. And so what does highest interest rates do? It draws your attention to money. If you're not sure what to do, what do you do? You get empowered, you get educated. You might listen to a podcast that empowers you about how to manage money more effectively. And so you start getting educated, you start getting empowered, you start making better decisions around money. So that's how higher interest rates can serve you. They draw your attention to money, you stop spending on things that are unnecessary, that don't really provide lasting fulfillment. Again, we consume things, we buy things in order to shift our mood, because we have association of the attainment of new things, new toys as positive. It's novel, right? But we can also create novel experiences by learning new things. Things. So we don't need to consume things in order to create that novelty, to create that newness, to create that excitement around novelty. Okay, and we can do, do this through listening to podcasts, through listening to going into deep, deeper into an area of interest for you, you can get this novel novelty. Um, experience or in, in order to lift your mood and rather than consume things. So you're probably getting what I'm saying is that there's other ways in which we can change our mood, elevate our mood other than food. Uh, if we want to empower ourselves around making better decisions around food, then we want to look at what happens when we consume. So there was a study, for example, uh, so when we consume high amounts of fat, and this was a study by Yale, and what they found was that high amounts of fat consumed cause our hypothalamus that regulates our appetite and satisfaction, it causes a dysregulation, it causes it to become, uh, it inhibits its ability or its effectiveness to do that governance over our, our feeling of um, fullness, satiation, and it can alter it. And it can alter it in such a way that we desire more of it. Okay. And that could be the primitive link that I drew to earlier, because high fat foods are satiable in terms of we, we have a natural desire tendency to want them because of that linked to higher calories, I need calories in order to survive. And in stressful times, calories were back then scarce, right? So we'd go through, we'd have famines, we would have droughts. And so we'd have these scarce moments where we would eat a whole lot less. And so we're wired to consume foods like fats because they're highly calorific. And so hence why if we can go on a high fat diet and it can be highly satiable. But the reason you're probably thinking, well, how, how does it work around the keto diet? You know, the keto diet is a high fat diet, low carbohydrates. What is it? What? How is that benefiting us? How do, how do people actually get results from that? Well, people get results because initially short term, the short term is that it does, it provides a feeling of fullness. But over time, this dysregulation happens. And, we, and as I said, we build up a tolerance to that intake of fat. And so what that intake that you had before that gave you satiation or gave you a feeling of fullness, you now, now need more of that fat, which is higher calories than protein or carbohydrates. You now need more of that in order to give the same level of satiation. So yes, you can have some short-term benefits around weight loss, but long-term it's not well. The, the research is 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 mixed. Okay, there's a, you know there's probably more short term studies around the benefit to keto, and you probably hear about the short term success people have. But long term, it's hard to sustain. It's hard to sustain high fat diets. It's quite it can be quite antisocial in terms of what do you choose to eat when you're out with your friends when there's not much sort of keto friendly foods. Um, and is it more people are, are people more getting the benefit from the keto diet because we consume less carbohydrates and they may have been consuming too many carbohydrates to begin with. Okay, so it's bringing some balance around the regulation of sugar and that's helping them. And that's why that, that could be part of the reasons why, and it probably is most likely a reason why they say they've got more sustained energy, they're more energetic because of blood sugar regulation. They're eating less excessive amounts of carbohydrates. We can achieve all this through moderation of all areas as opposed to going to another diet, jumping on a, the keto diet just because people are getting short-term success and not really understanding the long-term implications. Now, that Yale study, Yale, also mentioned that these high-fat diets alter, um, alter, alter not only the hypothalamus, which is our regulator of, of appetite, it alters the microglial cells in our mind and these microglia, microglia cells, 
glia are our immune cells for our brain okay and they they create homeostasis help create um homeostasis around our around inflammation so they essentially dampen you know a highly inflammatory environment but what they've found is that high fat diets alter the ability of the microglia glia cells and inflammation can get out of control so high fat diets have been associated with higher neuroinflammation and Higher neuroinflammation has been associated with depression, has been associated with Alzheimer's and has been associated with dementia, associated with depression. So we don't want higher neuroinflammation. Now, the other thing is to consider, and it's, you're probably a bit confused as you've probably seen studies that say high fat diets can really help those that are suffering from epilepsy or narcolepsy and yes they help these and that some of these these epilepsy studies around high fat diets are really advantageous because they're long-term studies right so they've been studied over long periods of time to show the efficacy of high fat diets around the management of epilepsy and also now we're starting to see more and more studies around narcolepsy which is that ability to not sleep soundly uh, so it's sort of light sleeping daytime drowsiness so yes those diets are helpful for those conditions but outside of that maybe not and then i guess the other thing it also comes down to is the types of fats you're eating so the fats we generally consume high high amounts of are saturated fats right they're the fats contained in sausages fatty meats um, so fatty meats sausages contain high amounts of saturated fats and these saturated fats not so great for our cardiovascular system and they're more pro-inflammatory the ones that are good fats and listen to the episode with udo erasmus on uh, uh fats that fats that kill fats that heal um so fats that kill fats that heal uh, episode with udo erasmus who is a fat expert he shares more about this topic of fats good fats but the the better fats <laughs> the more advantageous fats are the polyunsaturated the moly mono unsaturated so unsaturated fats now, these unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, are found in fish, uh, they're found in seeds, uh, they're found in nuts, okay? Same with monounsaturated fats, olive oil, avocado, nuts, seeds, monounsaturated fats. So they're the fats we want to consume more of, but people, when they're on these high-fat diets, generally go for more of the saturated fats. And then the other one is the fried fats, so the fried chips okay oh it's high fat <laughs> it's um they may gravitate but then again they're also high carbohydrates chips so they probably don't fit in they definitely don't fit into the keto sort of things um but it's probably more the bacon that you know having a lots of gristle and so they're fried saturated fats fried so we obviously that frying process creates it's, it, it can create trans fats okay trans fats are not healthy they're very oxidative in our body they age us <laughs> they create oxidative damage they you know that generate free radicals and this becomes problematic in terms of exacerbating inflammation within our body and that can cause you know systemic inflammation causes neuroinflammation and that is what we don't want so again there's many factors influencing our food choices and we, we need to look for alternatives in order to better manage our mood or if we're choosing food to manage our mood, make sure it's a better choice around food, such as more unprocessed carbohydrates. So if you, have, if you feel like some sugar, have some fruit, okay, as opposed to biscuits. If you're feeling like um, some fat, have, have some nuts and seeds, okay? Nuts and seeds are much better choices, okay? They, they're more packed with, you know, they're more superfoods as opposed to uh, foods that are providing little nutritional nourishment. So the other one I wanted to mention was around, so I mentioned the high fat, uh, high carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, and how that doesn't affect it affects our mood in terms of a positive correlation, but doesn't help us long term. Now, protein, let's get into protein. I just want to touch on protein before we finish this episode. So protein contains amino acids, it contains tryptophan. So tryptophan, uh, in terms of well, yes, we need tryptophan, um, high protein diets will obviously have higher amounts of tryptophan linked with sunshine or linked with light when we see light converts to serotonin 
And you need obviously some cofactors in order to do that conversion. Uh, so you need some B vitamins, you need some magnesium and things like that. And so this is where a high, high food diet is really um, not a, a whole food diet that is broad, um, that is not restrictive. It's not chucking out food groups like the keto uh, chucks out carbohydrates. <laughs> um, the high protein diet lessens your intake of other foods such as maybe fiber potentially. Um, so it is really important that we have this whole wholesome diet because so that we can enable that cascade from tryptophan to serotonin. Uh, so you need sunshine, but also you need the cofactors like I just mentioned, and that's going to come from a broader diet. Uh, and that converts to serotonin. Serotonin's mood enhancing. Okay, so uh, yes, by having a higher protein diet, you potentially can convert more serotonin. Uh, in your body. Your body can produce more serotonin. It has the ability to, has the tools to do that. <laughs> um, and also with, with darkness, then that serotonin will convert to melatonin. So that will enable a good night's sleep. So you've probably heard turkey is high in tryptophan. It is known to induce sleep. Well, so turkey had at nighttime in a dark environment. Yes, high tryptophan is darkness. So tryptophan uh, will convert to melatonin, uh, needs to convert to serotonin, then to melatonin. So it goes through that cascade. So certainly after a couple of hours of um, having the turkey, you're going to experiencing some, maybe some drowsiness, uh, depending on what else you're having at the time of the party. <laughs> so then there's other foods that enhance our mood can be such as alcohol, for example. Uh, alcohol, it really stops communication. It, it dampens the, the mind activity, okay? So it's an inhibitor. It essentially inhibits our mind. It takes our mind more into that limbic center, that emotional center where we sort of desire more. We have more desires, our desire center. Um, so we may make choices around more fatty foods because we lose that connection to the rational side of not eating fatty foods <laughs> and the benefits of not having fatty foods. We lose that, as you know, with alcohol, we become more irrational. We become more in that desire center, that animal center. Our behavior becomes more animalistic. And so, yes, it can sort of quieten the mind if you've got a really busy mind because it stops the communication pathways. It inhibits communication pathways in the mind. However, it can result in a, a cascade of negative health implications, such as you eat more fatty foods, eat more higher calorific foods. Um, and then that obviously then can translate into putting on some weight potentially. But then also the next day, you've also got that hangover effect because of all the toxins. Um, and, and your body's been so hard working trying to get rid of the toxins, it has no energy to give you the next day to do anything else. And so you're flat. And so yes, what I've like, I guess in summary, what I've shared with you is you can get some temporary relief through these mood enhancing foods, such as highly refined carbohydrates, sugars, such as highly processed fats. As I mentioned, the saturated fats, which are associated with takeaway foods, uh, through alcohol, uh, through chocolate, all these can boost your moods. But I also share with you other ways in which you can boost your moods through changing your perception. So if you're feeling down because you're seeing more negative in terms of what's happened, ask yourself, what's the positive? I went through the example of rising interest rates. Then I also share with you having chocolate, what's an alternative? You can exercise, you can move your body. You will also stimulate endorphins and get a similar effect to what chocolate gives you, but that's going to last longer, whereas the chocolate will send you on a high and then on a crash. That exercise will keep you going for longer, okay? And then will help you with your night's sleep, whereas excessive chocolate consumption will impact your night's sleep. So yes, some of these short-term benefits of these mood enhancing foods result in not so great long-term consequences. So if you want health for a long term, you want to live a quality of life and a, a long life of high quality um, energy, vitality, stamina, then make some better decisions and choose some of these alternatives I've shared with you today on this episode. And you will, you'll have a much more level energy throughout the day. You'll sleep better that night. You'll wake up more revitalized the next morning and you'll build momentum, positive momentum around around your health, uh, compounding momentum around your health, as opposed to the short-term fixes that result in compounding negative effects to your health and well-being. So I hope this was helpful. Please share it with others that you know that are really affected um, 
that have foods that probably are less advantageous for them, for their mood, to better manage their mood. So share their, you know, this, this episode with them so that they can understand some alternatives that can help them uh, still lift their, elevate their mood, however, have better long-term health benefits as opposed to consequential uh, negative health benefits. So please share it with them. And yes, thank you, Tazzy people, for tuning in to the Me and My Health Up podcast. Thank you to all the Americans for tuning in and enhancing and enlightening your well-being. And thank you for all your continued to support, no matter where in the world you're from. I really appreciate you prioritizing your health. Having a high value on health, as you know, will impact other areas positively as opposed to having a low value on health and negatively impacting the areas that you value. As you know, without your health, you cannot enjoy your wealth. Without your health, you can't support others as well because you are needing so much support because of your ill health. So again, if you want to have a thriving family, have thriving relationships, yes, put some value on health. Take care, everyone. Until next time, enjoy and continue to empower yourself and look forward to empowering you further in the next episode of Me and My Health Up. Podcast disclaimer. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare, or professional advice and are provided for general information purposes only. All care is taken in the preparation of the information in this podcast. Connected Wellness Proprietary Limited, operating under the brand Me and My Health Up, does not make any representations or give any warranties about its accuracy, reliability, completeness, or suitability for any particular purpose. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it are not to be used as a substitute for professional, medical, psychological, psychiatric, or any other mental health care or health care in general. Me and My Health Up recommends you seek the advice of a doctor or qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Inform your doctor of any changes that you made to your lifestyle and discuss these with your doctor. Do not disregard medical advice or delay visiting a medical professional because of something you hear in this podcast. This podcast has been carefully prepared on the basis of current information. Changes in circumstances after publication may affect the accuracy of this information. To the maximum extent permitted by the law, Me and My Health Up disclaims any such representations or warranties to the completeness, accuracy, merchantability, or fitness for purpose of this podcast and will not be liable for any expenses, losses, damages, incurred indirect or consequential damages or costs that may be incurred as a result of the information being inaccurate or incomplete in any way and for any reason. No part of this podcast can be reproduced, redistributed, published, copied, or duplicated in a form without prior permission of me and my health up.